All right, now this is the highlight. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I promise you, if you've been listening to great speakers, and you have, and you've been taking great notes from people that have taught you things, which I hope you have, you are now getting ready for the superlative experience. This next conversation I'm having is with someone that I consider an icon of the culture. She's someone who is multifaceted. You can't hold her back. You can't predict her. She injects sanity and thought. And our theme is from confusion to clarity. She is the epitome of clarity. Of course, I say all of that mainly because she's from Brooklyn. <laughs> and I'm from, I'm from Brooklyn, although I think she's from Flatbush. I'm from Best Eye. Right. She's in Best Eye now. So uh, without any further ado, let me introduce to uh, just the three people on earth that don't know her and present to everybody else on the planet that I'm sure wakes up to her lovely voice every morning on The Breakfast Club, Sister Angela Yee. Angela, how are you? Oh my gosh, first of all, Pastor Stories, I have to say that might have been the nicest introduction I ever got, so I'm going to make sure that I take that and use that. <laughs> are you kidding? Listen, now, uh, I I'm not going to do this in order because there's something pressing on me that I want to start with, which is not really the beginning, but I want to start where I want to start since mm -hmm. I'm in charge. Um, we should be calling you Ambassador Yi. And I'm going to write a letter to the Breakfast Club begging those cats to start calling you Ambassador. You're the Ambassador for the New York Public Library, the first Ambassador they've ever had. Yes. You're, you're the Ambassador, the Global Ambassador for BSE, I think it is. Yeah, Brooklyn Sports and Entertainment. Right. The global ambassador. So, you know, the, the last time I checked, ambassadors should be called ambassador. How, how did you get into this ambassador business? Here you are, uh, the voice of the morning. Here you are, graduate, having majored in English. Here you are, you, you managed uh, artists. Mm -hmm. You've got your own business and you have time to be an ambassador for somebody? What well, that? that's when you really are doing something that means a lot to you. And so working with Brooklyn, with Brooklyn Sports and Entertainment, that is the Barclays Center, that's the Brooklyn Nets and the New York Liberty, things like that are really important to me just because, first of all, it's exciting to me to have the New York Liberty in Brooklyn now, moving yeah. forward, you know, once everything with the pandemic is over and next year when we're out of the bubble. But that's exciting because I think our WNBA teams need our support. And I'm gonna make sure that whatever I can do, we elevate those women. Also with the Brooklyn Nets, I'm from Brooklyn. So, and you know, you have to come to some games too. I mean, I, I have know. To come. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm a big women's Thank basketball you. fan. And uh, a couple of my kids from Rutgers play for the, uh, for the Liberty, I think. I think, uh, well, Essence Carson was there, she left. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a girl from Brooklyn too that plays in the in WNBA, but and I'm coming. I'm coming. Right. And, I'm coming. I'm coming. And even for the Brooklyn Nets, I'm gonna have you virtually courtside for this season. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Listen, I don't get to Brooklyn enough, but I I am so proud of you. I'm so impressed by you, and you're such an inspiration because you're not a linear person. You're not just a one line person. You're broad. You're you're inclusive. You're expansive. You've been involved in everything from AIDS awareness to uh, breast cancer and other kinds of causes and D3. I mean, yeah. you, you've done two or three events for us. I remember the first time you came to our church mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was really trying to get to know who you were. And when I, when I came into the room and saw about a thousand kids there just to see you, it told me who you were. So. Tell us now, you're from Brooklyn. You went to Wesleyan, I think, Wesleyan, right? Yes. Went to Wesleyan, yes. majored in English. How did you get from like a high academic pursuit at a very prestigious university into being the queen spokesperson for the culture early in the morning on the breakfast club? Well, for myself, and that's why the New York Public Library is important to me too. I've always been a big reader ever since I was in kindergarten even. And so I would always sit around just reading and then I would write little short stories. My mom actually brought some of those over to me 
during this pandemic from the house just for me to wow. see like some of the things that I was writing when I was a little kid. It's really funny to look back at it. Some of it's disturbing, but um, <laughs> that is part of what I would do though. If I was like angry at anything or, you know, you get mad at your parents, I would like sit down and write a little short story about it. And so that's always been the way that I express myself. And I always knew that from when I was younger, some way I was going to be a writer. And so that's kind of what got me on the path to where I am. And that's why working with the New York Public Library was really exciting for me. I would go to the library all the time as a kid and just sit there and read all day. And I remember even some of my best dates have been to like the bookstore to go to Barnes and Noble. And we would go in there and like read little horoscope books and stuff like that. It was, you know, I was young, but it was cute little things like that. that yeah always interested in me so that interested me so that's why it's always important to me to connect with people that I think are you know big on literature and reading and so that's why I also started a book club and I have Angela Heath's book club that I do in Brooklyn once a month and we're gonna take that virtual next but you know I think it's really important to do things that you're passionate about and spread that love to people also so when I went to college I already knew I was majoring in English and I thought in my head I would graduate be a writer, be a photographer, and just live this free-spirited life where I would be living on an island somewhere writing books. But I ended up in the entertainment business. And I know you know my first job was working with Wu-Tang. Right, right, right. You know, it's funny. Wu, um, RZA from Wu-Tang lived um, in Jersey, not far from me. And I had lunch with him one time. We were about two hours together, eating and talking, eating and talking. I probably understood about 10 minutes of what we talked about because he, he has his own language. You know? oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was the funny, nicest guy. Mm -hmm. I just had no idea what he was talking about. But a lot of the work, that, a, a lot of the work that you do is volunteer work. Yeah, mm -hmm. You know, and, and because, because we talk about streams of income, we're going to get to this whole economic strategy in a few minutes. But uh, almost everybody I know is working hard to get a new deal, to get a new job, uh, to increase their revenue. But you figured out a way to expand your brand to include doing things for which you don't get paid. Talk about balancing the need to increase revenue on the one hand, but also the ability to include volunteer work. I'm glad you said that. We just had this conversation the other day about sometimes we do things that we may not necessarily be like super excited to do, but it's important work. And I, we had this whole conversation about it on The Breakfast Club. And I do feel like, you know, they always say to whom um, who much is given, much is expected. And so I feel like I need to balance out. Yes, I get paid, you know, pretty decently at my job. And I have other side hustles that I do and appearances. But at the same time, there's certain things that I feel like are really important. You know, when I do certain book clubs, I do that work for free, even working like, you know, with the New York Public Library. We were in the midst of starting this whole book club program with high schools in the Bronx and in Queens and in Brooklyn. We had to put that on hold. But things like that, I can definitely take the time out of my day for somebody to feel like it impacted their life just to have that, you know, those conversations and to encourage people to do. Sometimes I think we need more exposure to be able to see things and feel like we can achieve them, even when we open the juice bar. The juice bar is not a get rich quick type of thing. It really maintains itself. We make, you know, enough to pay everybody, pay the bills, not a whole lot of money because we don't charge a lot of money for the juices. Right. And part of that was opening something in our neighborhood. It wasn't like I'm about to get rich off of opening a juice bar. It was more like we're putting this in our neighborhood so that it can be something beneficial for people. And we've been open throughout this whole pandemic. And it's been great for me to see people trying to be more you know and i've always wanted people to be more concerned about their health so just for people to really be taking that as seriously as they have been and having a juice bar you know i do my wealth wednesdays there once a month where we get free information about finances which has always been important to me i have a library in there i love your library in the background i told you but we have books there and a lot of times people just take the books which is okay with me if you're going to take something take a book that's fine not that i'm encouraging you all to empty out our library but <laughs> It's not anything I get mad about because I always come in and replenish our bookshelves. But it's just things like that that I think are important in the community. Like I said, I have the book club. I have a running club too, Run With Ye, that we were doing in Prospect Park. And that was just for me to encourage people that had never run before or maybe just needed to get out and do some physical activities to come out and run or walk 
or a job or a combination of those things. And it's been exciting for me to see people who might not have ever tried to do these physical activities, just come out, give it a chance, and then start coming every single month and then forming their own little running clubs and going with people that they met. I remember there were two women that told me they actually took a trip together after meeting at the running club and they did like a whole hiking experience. And that's really what it's all about for people to see that, you know, you are somebody that they can talk to. I'm a regular person. I'm right there at the running club. I'm right there at the book club. I'm at the juice bar. I live in Best Guy still. And it's important for me for people to see that, yes, you can be here and be successful and create your own path. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about branding now and, um, when we talk about branding, sometimes I think people see it too narrowly. Uh, mm -hmm. When I talk to artists, especially, I remind them that the icons in, from the entertainment world, like Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis was as famous for Jerry's kids, for his charity, as he was Jerry's movies. And I think more uh, black entertainers and black celebrities should understand that they will be sometimes more remembered for the good that they do than the hits that they make. And right. you, you approach this whole brand idea as being one that focuses as much on your character as it does your celebrity. And that, that's, that's phenomenal. I don't know who taught you that. Who did teach you that? I mean, who were your role models? Who did you look up to as an example of how to do what it is you were going to do with your brand? I think it was more of I wish I had more people that helped me when right. I was coming up because Everything I kind of did, I learned through trial and error myself, even yeah. buying my first home. That was me just, you know, one of my best friends bought a house. So I was with her while she was looking. And then I was just learning as I went along and Googling things and researching and trying to find out what to do. And I'm like, man, this would have been so much easier if I had, you know, somebody that could have inspired me or taught me how to do these things and gave me some advice. But then I also realized that everybody's going to give you different advice too. And sometimes what works for you doesn't work for other people. And even, you know, I was saying I, I paid off my mortgage on my house in January and I bought the house six years ago. I remember when you bought it. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people will give you different advice about that. People will give you different advice about how you should get a mortgage, if you should have PMI, what you can afford. And so for me, certain things I know work for me that might not work for other people and people do things different ways. And so while I do wish I would have had a mentor for certain things, I also feel like I was able to really teach myself and create my own lane and do what worked for me. Cause sometimes you listen to too many different conflicting things and you don't know which way to move. And so I could only blame myself if things didn't work out. And another thing I did, even with opening the juice bar and best Die, juices for life, you know, I went to Styles P, I went to Leo, his partner, and I was like, look, I want to do this juice bar, and I want to partner with you guys on it because you have three successful ones already. So the importance of that for me was team up with somebody from your community that's doing something that you admire. You don't have to be their competition. You can actually be partners with someone, and you don't have to put everything on yourself all the time. I'm realistic. I know my limitations. I know that I can't spread myself too thin because you don't want to be focusing on 20 different things and then you can't be great at any of them. So sometimes you do need to say, okay, we have to help each other out. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I'm an old uh, activist, you know that. I, I was trained in the 70s, coming out of the 60s in activism and protest. And I've been doing my best to give advice, to give resources and other kinds of support to the young activists today. I think those of us who have experience and have track records instead of trying to hold on to the reins of leadership, should really nurture the younger people. And that's what I've been trying to do in, uh, in cities around the country. Uh, however, uh, some of the advice I've been giving them has to do with understanding the limitations of protest. Protest is critical. Without protest, we would not bring attention to injustices and inequities that otherwise would go unnoticed. But protest has its limits and after protest, which is really what this conference is about. We need concrete strategies to improve the quality of our own lives and the lives of other people. You've right. been involved in doing concrete things in terms of entrepreneurship and education and, and mentoring. And I just, I'm just wondering what you're feeling, what you're seeing now as we see young people who are, who, who are woke. You know, I tell our young people, I don't want you to be woke and broke. You know, I want you to be woke. I don't want you to be broke. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what, what are you seeing now 
you're, you're talking to artists and entertainers, there's a new kind of consciousness and, and passion around social justice. Just, just share from your heart what you're feeling during this season and where, where do you think we should be trying to help younger people go? I think that social media has actually really helped out social activism and political activism so much just because we didn't have that coming up. Right. And so something happened and we might not ever hear about it. And right. so it would be so local. I think right now something happens in our community. Somebody, a Karen or a Ken, is harassing a black person and immediately we can go to social media, we can post somebody and we've seen some of the repercussions from that. We've seen people lose their jobs, lose their opportunities because of things that they've done that are affecting our community. And you might call the cops on someone who's bird watching and then the cops come and next thing you know, you know, this person saying, oh, he attacked me, he did this to me and they could have gotten arrested or even right. worse, killed. And so people have to understand that when they take action like that, how much that harms us. Because, you know, historically when the cops come, they don't necessarily believe us. We already look like we're the ones that are doing something wrong. And so I'm excited about the fact that we can see these things in action happening now and see them go viral and see people face those repercussions from their actions and see that it's not us. A lot of times there's this false narrative out there and you know now you can see where the real problems are coming from. I also, and I, I agree with what you said, you can't be woke and broke. And that's something that I was talking to Tamika Mallory the other day, and she was discussing how, look, don't be ashamed if you're an activist to ask for money. You need right. to have money. People need to get bailed out of jail. People need to travel. Yeah. People need to eat. This work is not free. And so I can see that people are really, and you know, those $1, $5, $10, $20 dollars donations, they really do add up and mean a lot. And I think now activism is also for people a lot cooler. Like you see, you know, to make again, shout outs from Beyonce and, and see all of that right now. And I feel like we're in a really difficult time. And while it's a pandemic going on, we have a president that is not a leader that's endangering us. And we have, you know, all of these narratives going on at the same time, but it's also woken a lot of people up. And I think that's so important. If there's anything that we can take from this time, let's figure out how we can make demands for ourselves in the future. And I also want to encourage, I see more people wanting to run for office. And I think that's been great too. Just to see younger people, we need that. Like we need younger people in different positions and local offices, you know, working their way up. And I love that too. So I just want to encourage people, if you feel like you can make a change and make a difference and start your own campaign, please, by all means, go for it. You know, I was watching CNN one night a few weeks ago and they had uh, five black female mayors on to do a one hour interview. I think it was Atlanta and, and four of the cities. Uh, and it was inspiring. I mean, you, feel, I mean it feels great. Uh, but what's interesting is you got an award named after Shirley Chisholm, who was one of my heroes also. I love Shirley Chisholm. Well, you're from Brooklyn. You have to love Shirley Chisholm. We're, we, we have to love her. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I don't I don't see you running for office. Do you see yourself maybe running for political office in the future? Um, I no, I don't think I want to do that. I'm definitely all here to support everyone. Listen, I love Yvette Clark. I love Hakeem Jeffries. I love my local politicians. Right. But you know, truthfully, I really believe that my work is doing this volunteer work that I've been doing, you know, starting my own businesses. And encouraging other people to start their own businesses too. You know, I work a lot with the Small Business Administration to help people figure out what they can do. Yeah. Well, I, I assume I'm the same way. I don't want to run for office. I don't yeah. want to be in office. I want to help. I want to be rich enough to fund the campaigns. <laughs> no, I love that. And listen, I've hosted fundraisers for Vet Clark and for Hakeem Jeffries because yeah. you know those are my Brooklyn people right there. So that's, right. that's, that's important right. to me. And even just giving people exposure, we have this platform on the Breakfast Club. If we can use that to book people who are running for office in different cities, we're all for it. Right. Well, given this pandemic, I think another aspect of its instruction, what we've learned from it is that we're going to have to think even more seriously about owning our own businesses. Job, the job market is fragile. Uh, before the pandemic, technology was changing the economics of work. And we know that artificial intelligence and robotics were, were really uh, aimed at reducing at least 3 million jobs from this country, but also 
uh, adding about 10 million more jobs. You, you've started your own businesses. You've been in successful venture. You've been in a venture that has to be retooled and restarted. What, what, what are the three or four things that we should be emphasizing as we motivate and teach people about starting a business, uh, buying a business, or owning a business? What have you learned about business ownership? Uh, okay, so this was something that I just learned recently. When we did the juice bar, we did that with our own funds. And so now I have another business called Drink Fresh Juice, and I'm doing that with investor funds. And so what was important for me, because I've already invested a lot of my own money. So I do think it's important to invest your own money to show how much you believe in yourself. But I also feel like you also don't want to go broke, like we said, right. trying to do right. something. And so right. I think that's important to have a great business plan that goes along with the investors. Make sure you have an amazing plan put together so people can see. You can't just go to somebody and say, hey, can you invest in my business? You need to have a deck and show them how can they make money and have your financials right. on point. And so you can't take for granted, I know this person, they'll invest in my company. You have to say, okay, here's what we can do for you. It's not just a, a given that somebody should invest just because you have a great idea. We can all have a great idea, right? But what's the strategy behind it? And so that has been one of the most important things that I've learned because you know, I was discussing this before we even started. The juice bar worked out really well because I teamed up with somebody who knew what they were doing. I started another business that was fresh that I had never done before. And so I've had to really like put together the right team and refocus and re-strategize. And that's another thing I would say is to be patient. I know a lot of times we want to start a business and we feel like, okay, how come I'm not making money? How come this isn't happening right away? Why am I not getting the support that I want? But if you're really committed and passionate about something, those things take time to build. And yeah. so it's really important for you to be patient, to take the time to build, to always be learning, take classes. You know, I told you I work with the Small Business Administration on certain things. Like, you can go there and your taxpayer dollars actually go towards you being able to get those resources. And so while it might feel like, okay, these resources are free, you're paying for it with your taxpayer dollars, go and take those classes and learn yeah. what you can learn and make sure that one of the most important things is networking. And I would tell you, networking might feel like, oh, I don't feel like going out, I don't feel like having to go to this dinner, this event, but those things are so important. Networking is working. And so make sure that you get out there and meet the right people, make sure that you keep in touch, make sure that you're not only calling people when you need something, but you're calling people to check on them and see how they're doing and just, be up to date because sometimes an opportunity might come just because you're on somebody's mind, just because you hit them up and be a genuine person and treat everybody well. And those are some things I think are really important. Yeah, you're right. I had an experience just today where a person that I have not spoken to in about two years uh, was on the phone with a billionaire. This guy is, uh, is a multimillionaire. He's on the phone with a billionaire. They were talking about how to help people in a certain situation. And because we've stayed in touch, and we've had good relationships out of networking. They patched me into a three-way call, and now I have a new relationship that I can leverage to help hundreds of other people. So you talked about planning, that's critical. You talked about uh, forming partnerships with people who know what they're doing. You talked about learning and uh, going to classes and training. You slipped in the word passion. I mean, you have to really be passionate and you talked about patience. All of those principles, by the way, are not only in the D-Free curriculum, but we have a special D-Free book for entrepreneurs. And uh, that book emphasizes uh, business plans and emphasizes strategies. And uh, I'm glad to hear you say that because now I can, I can say Angela Yee is, uh, is in alignment with and agreement with the D-Free entrepreneurship strategy. We you just know I am. That's why me and you are here when it comes to yeah, everything we are. we can do we are. It's, it's, it's uh, much deeper than Brooklyn. We just formed a partnership with the Fresno, California uh, Black Chamber of Commerce, and we partnered with them to help them uh, train 350 Black-owned businesses in the Fresno region. We're using our um, curriculum, and what we'll do is we'll use this video because they know who you are. They listen to The Breakfast Club all over the country and they see you on Revolt TV. And uh, that's why I appreciate you sharing this platform with us. We've been doing this for 15 years, Angela. 
And um, we plan to do this for at least another 15 years. And I'm hoping to stay even more closely connected with you. As I said, you are for the generation coming behind me, uh, what the Today Show was for us. They don't, they, don't, they don't watch NBC in the morning. They listen to The Breakfast Club. They get their news from The Breakfast Club. They identify, you know, rising stars on The Breakfast Club. And I just appreciate the level of seriousness that you bring to that platform because there's so much silly stuff that's being fed to our young people. And in your own entertaining way, you know, uh, all of you bring substance and content and focus and you challenge people to think. And, and that's what I love about you. What's next for Angela Yee? Well, um, I've been working on my real estate game because right now I'm in the planning stages of, okay, you know, when I decide I want to retire, whenever that will be, I want to make sure that I'm very comfortable. And so I do have my house in Brooklyn. I bought another condo in Williamsburg. Oh, good. And that's an investment property. So that is paying for itself. And I got it at an amazing price. So I did that in November mm -hmm. of last year. I also own two houses in Detroit. One of them, I, well, I had three. I sold one. And then I still have two more. So I have one more that I am in the process of rehabbing to sell. The other one I'm keeping because I do want to do some great things in the city of Detroit. I love Detroit. I love and it. So, Yes, and it's a great opportunity. I think a lot of people, and I, I said this the other day, I was like, look, a lot of people want to be homeowners, and I think homeownership is so important. And in New York, it's difficult. In LA, it's difficult. In certain places, it is, it is, it is difficult. So sometimes it might be moving to get the right opportunity. And I know women who have their own businesses in Detroit that move there just to start their businesses that have been really successful. And so I just want to encourage people to look outside of where you are also and think and think about where those opportunities might be for the future. So I have my Drink Fresh Juice relaunching and that will be happening in August. And we have an amazing relaunch that I'm so excited about. We have so many things in place so that when we launch, we'll already be in certain uh, locations. I can't even say too much about it right now because it hasn't happened yet, but we have commitments from different grocery stores. It's th things I didn't do the first time around. I thought it would be a subscription-based business, but you know, shipping out those juices can be expensive because they have to stay cold and you have to get them there quickly. So that was something I hadn't anticipated, but we found a remedy for that. And I want to tell people, even if your business that you're doing right away doesn't happen the way you expected it to, that means you just have to pivot and restructure if you truly That's believe right. in yourself. And so I have that happening. Um, you know, I still have my lip service podcast. Hopefully you're not listening to that past the stories. Um, <laughs> no, I, I've, I've heard about it. It's it's kind of outside of my my range. <laughs> well, you know, we touch on all different topics, and yeah. so you know, it's it's. Hey, Devon Franklin was on there. Oh, good, good, good. good. <laughs> but um, I, I support everything you do. Um, no, I appreciate whenever, it. Whenever our platform can help you expand your reach, we're here for you. Um, we believe in you. We talk about you all the time, all the time. I mean, your ears, as the old folk used to say, your ears must be ringing. Mm -hmm. And uh, more importantly, we admire and respect you for your work, for your quality, for your integrity, and for your constant involvement. So let's stay close. Absolutely. Let's, yeah. Oh, and one last thing I want to say. Um, Angela Yee Day is August 28th, and I'll be launching my nonprofit on that day. So, oh, great. Um, yeah, I got that all together. It's called Well Read. And so it's for wellness and literacy. And so well, is the name of the nonprofit. So I'm really excited to bring some great programming and we should definitely work on some things. Do that. When, when the new juice comes out, we'll promote it on the podcast. When the Well Read Foundation launches, we'll participate and support the launch. Uh, anything you do, because you are a strategic asset for our community and for an entire generation. So thank you. Thank, thank God for you. And thank you for helping us celebrate our 15th year of the D3 financial uh, freedom movement. As you, as you can see, those of you who've been listening and watching, uh, the reason Angela Yee is so important to us is because she helps us if we are attempting to go from, from crisis and confusion to clarity. If you didn't understand what she said about uh, getting investors and getting trained and having a plan, then you need to listen again because it was as clear as it could be. 
So, Ange, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. God bless all of your pursuits. Uh, stay safe where you are and come home safely when you're done. I can't wait to see you in person. I will all be right. there. Let me know as soon Bye. as you open back up. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.